Welcome back everyone, I'm Professor Rhett Smith for ProtonGuru.com. We're going to go over Lesson 7.6 today, and this continues our discussion of nuclear magnetic resonance, and specifically like to look at carbon-13 NMR, and where we expect to see peaks in the carbon-13 NMR spectrum for different types of chemical moieties. One important point I'd like to make here is that the chemical shifts are sort of normalized to what people have decided is going to be a chemical shift of zero and that is for this tetramethylsilane. Often you'll see it abbreviated TMS, and you might see spectra where there's a peak at zero, and that peak is generally not attributable to an organic molecule, but rather to the internal standard that's been added. Now, if we look at the actual organic groups, like a methyl group attached to an alkyl chain, in a carbon-13 NMR spectrum, that comes between about 10 and 35. If you have a CH2 along an alkyl chain, it's between 15 and 50, a CH might be as high as 60, and you can see that these sort of alkyl components come towards the low end of the spectrum. When we consider that as we start putting the carbon into different hybridization states, like sp2 in these two examples, you start to get above 100 ppm for those chemical shifts attributable to those carbon atoms. When you see a carbon in sp hybridized, orbital, you have about 60 to 85, and just like we talked about in our general introduction to NMR spectrometry, if you start to put electronegative atoms adjacent to the carbon, it pulls electron density away and moves them to a higher chemical shift value than you have for otherwise comparable alkyl groups. And of course, the more electronegative the atom gets, that you put adjacent to that carbon, the further to the high end of chemical shift or downfield, you start to get that signal. And if you put a double bond to the carbon, you've got an oxygen doubly bound to it, and you have an sp2 hybridized carbon, you start to get to the very high numbers, even as high as about 200 in some cases. So the carbon-13 NMR spectrum runs from around 0 to 200 ppm. Now, rather than trying to memorize this table, it's a good idea to think about sort of dividing the carbon NMR spectrum into these sort of quadrants based on the chemical shift that's the x-axis. So to start off we have tetramethylsilane. So there should be a 4 there if you can make that correction. Now at the very low end, right beside that standard, are just alkyl groups, around 0 to 40. Now these are approximate ranges. If you have a carbon beside an electronegative atom like chlorine or fluorine, you're going to see a signal between around 40 and 100, and likewise if you have a carbon that's sp hybridized like this. Now if you have an alkene or an aromatic group, those tend to have carbon atoms between 100 and 175. And if you have a carbon that's part of a carbonyl with a double bond O going to it, you start to see signals at the very high end of the chemical shift above 175. Now you should treat these as pretty approximate ranges and as additive. For example, consider this carbon that is an aromatic carbon. It's already going to lie above 100. If I also put an electronegative group on it, and I say, well, I've got this effect of putting an electronegative group next to an alkyl group, but it's already on an aromatic group. It's going to pull it even further that way. Or if I have a carbon in a carbonyl, and I put another electronegative atom, it's going to pull it further that way. So this is a good starting point for analyzing especially pretty simple spectra, but recognize that every change you make to the molecule will perturb the chemical shift of that given carbon. Now carbon-13 NMR is usually run in such a way the instrument avoids any splitting, so the signals tend to be all singlets. Now using our knowledge of the usual ranges for carbon-13 resonances, we can infer some structural information even from a simple spectrum like this. If we see that we have a peak between around 0 and 40, we kind of think that's probably an alkyl set of carbons that are chemically equivalent to each other. And we have another set of carbon atoms that gives a signal B, and that's between 60 and 80. That's probably a carbon next to some electronegative atom. And this is the actual compound I used to simulate the spectrum here. You have the carbon nuclei giving you signal A, are these three that are chemically and magnetically equivalent, and then you have this carbon B that gives you the signal B. In our problem-solving video that you'll see right after this on the course site at ProtonGuru.com, we solve a lot of NMR spectra, both carbon and proton, in the next couple lessons, 
and this is really the best way to see illustrated with real examples how to solve these spectra.